thank you for joining us wherever you're joining us from. The next half an hour to 45 minutes really is our time to set aside time, to set aside distractions, and experience his presence. So thank you for being here. Let's worship together. Come on, here we go.
Father, with every fiber of our beings, we long to give you praise. Even when we don't feel like it, we know you're worthy, so we give you praise. Even when it's not a convenient time, we still set aside time and make time to give you praise because you're worthy. Even when all we can see is the obstacle in front of us, we give you praise with every fiber of our being because you're worthy and you're good. We thank you for moments like these in your presence. God, I just pray a special blessing on every single family that's watching, every single person that has tuned into this. God, we pray that they would experience you in a new way. We love you today. Amen. Don't go anywhere. Stay tuned for our great message from our lead pastor, Pastor Troy. Hey, it is great to be with you on this wonderful day that the Lord has given us, this second Sunday in August. And today we're going to continue in our series, uh, Unshakable, Standing Firm in an Unsteady World. And what I want to do is I want to talk and minister to you through God's Word on how to be unshakable in a cancer-cultured world. Now, in the middle of March, I don't know where you were at, but I was celebrating our 26th wedding anniversary with Therese on March 11th. But a little bit after that, our world changed completely here in California and in the United States of America, as so many lockdowns began to happen because of the coronavirus. We heard the word cancel being used for NBA games. We heard the word being used for NHL games, the PGA Tour, um, Major League Soccer games that were on the horizon. Church events were canceled. Indoor services were canceled. College spring sporting events were canceled. NASCAR was canceled and concerts. But since then, our nation has gone from canceling events to now people in our society are canceling people. When someone does, or, or does something that runs offense to our current cultural preferences, our society chooses to now cancel that person. Uh, people shut them down with uh, horrible references or horrible names or even verbal attacks. And it's come to the point where that, if that person has a TV show, people call for boycotts or even the removal of that TV show. And if they're a sports figure, people might burn their jerseys or, or they might even get fired from their profession simply for saying or doing something that offends the culture of today. Now, instead of having a healthy discussion or an understanding of why that person said what they said or did what they did, the cancel culture chooses to not only not even engage in the ideas of what that person did or, or what happened or even discuss the, the situation, but rather they want to shame them out to existence. As a matter of fact, in other words, that person, they want to cancel them no matter what they say or no matter what they do. Now, the cancel culture is a term used to describe a recent movement that has led people to lose their jobs or their influence because of troubling things that they said, whether that's on social media or even in pictures that they produced or videos that they said, whether it be present or it be past on those situations. Now, here in America, people have always had a right to say things. They've always had a right to believe a certain way or act as they choose, whether it was right or wrong. That's just the way it is. And the merits of that person's speech or their beliefs or their actions would be debated even as to the right to hold on uh, to them being defended. But now our culture wants to move toward a honor-shaming culture. And we have witnessed many examples of cancer culture. I, re I recall of hearing a high school student that was accepted into Harvard University. He was just delighted as can be. And eventually his acceptance was rescinded due to inappropriate messages he wrote when he was 16 years old. So maybe that was two years ago. The student expressed regret. He, he commented that I see the world differently now. I'm a little older, a little wiser, and I'm embarrassed by the petty and flippant things that I did as a kid in, in those screenshots that I posted or whatever it may be. Well, Harvard's admissions committee voted to keep him out of the school. And certainly the student's comments were inappropriate in the strongest of terms. And even though he apologized, he was canceled. He was canceled by Harvard and more significantly, countless other people on Twitter. Matter of fact, there was a meme made about this individual and it said, I'm about to end this man's whole career 
simply for what he said two or three years ago. In a cancel culture, a single mistake is, is basically unforgivable. There's no forgiveness because it's not simply a guilty act. Rather, the mistake defines the individual's identity. Because you said this and because you did this, your, your, your reputation, your character, you as an individual are going to be um, canceled out. And the goal of the cancel culture is to shame someone. And someone who is shamed, they want them to just simply be canceled out. But what is more troubling to me is when people experience the cancer culture because of things that they said many years ago or maybe even decades ago. Recently, James Gunn, many of you may know who he is, but he was fired as the director for The Guardian of the Galaxies in Volume 3. He directed the first two films, but because of some inappropriate jokes that he had made a decade ago, and to add irony, it turned out that not only did he disavow those previous tweets or things that he said, but that he spoke publicly about those things several times in terms of what he did and how bad, and how bad he felt about them. Now, in America, people usually feel guilty because they've done something bad. Has, has that ever happened to you where you did something that was so wrong and you felt guilty because you, you did something that was bad and you know it was and you felt guilty of that? Well, in Eastern culture, they focus on honor-shame framework. And what that basically means is people are guilty because they're viewed as a bad person, period, in society's eyes. And redemption doesn't come by fixing the mistake, and an apology isn't enough. You must be canceled. You must be shamed. And that is what's happening here in America. So today I want to explore a gospel-centered response to the cancel culture movement. And I want us to expose a couple of things. Or I want us to talk about a couple of things and what God says in His Word. Number one is this. Is there a lesson uh, we can learn from Scripture about our past or present sins or what we've said or done? The second thing is how as Christians should we respond to this cultural reality that we're living in today? Now, in the ancient culture where Jesus lived in, uh, cancel culture was literally permeating the world that was living in during the time of Christ. For example, the story of a blind man disavowed by his parents, was cast out by religious leaders, provides a great example for us, and it's found in John chapter 9. And in John 9, we discover that Jesus meets this young man, and as he meets this young man, he was born blind. He was born blind. So Jesus, having compassion on him, healed the young man by basically making mud pies and putting them on his eyes and healing him. The Pharisees were so mad at Jesus because according to them, he healed the man. Get this. Dun, 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 dun. He healed the man on the Sabbath. He worked on the Sabbath. And you're not supposed to do that. Now, the Pharisees were so upset that they confronted the young man's parents. They wanted to find out, is this Jesus, the Messiah, the one who healed your son and so forth? But of course, his mom and dad were non-confronted people, and so they passed the buck on to their son to basically tell him, uh, to tell them if, if Jesus had healed him. So in John 9, 22, it says this, his parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Now, let me help, help you understand what's going on here. To be put out from the synagogue was the biggest public shame of all. You would not want the religious leaders or the Pharisees to put that label on you. That was like a taboo back then. And their son, who had not seen for a long, long time because he was born blind, now finally was able to see, wouldn't be socially intimidated by these uh, religious leaders. He stood up to the Pharisees and forthrightly, he responded and said, Jesus healed me. He healed me. And unable to handle the public challenge to their sense of honor, the Pharisees delivered the communal shame knockout punch by casting the young man out of the synagogue. And that would be his identity. That is what he was going to be known for. Not being healed by Jesus, but basically for proclaiming that Jesus had healed him and as Lord. And in short, basically, what did the Pharisees do? They canceled him out. They canceled him out. Jesus' radar for unjustifying shame drove him to end up seeking this young man out. With tender authority, not like the authority that the Pharisees and the religious leaders came, and he gave this young man not only the honor of physical sight, but now he wanted to come to him and give him the honor of spiritual sight. So it reads in John 9, 24 through 39. It'll be up on the screen for you, but it says this. So for the second time, they called in the man who had been blind and told him, God should get the glory for this because we know this man, Jesus, is a sinner. I don't know whether he's a sinner, the man replied. We're talking about the blind man. But I know this, I was blind and I can now see. 
But what did he do, they asked. How did he heal you? Look, the man exclaimed, I told you once, didn't you listen? Why do you not want to hear it again? Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciple too? Then they cursed him and said, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know God spoke to Moses, but we don't even know where this man comes from. Why, why this very strange, uh, why that's very strange, the man replied. He healed my eyes, and yet you don't know where, where he comes from. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but he is ready to hear those who worship him and do his will. Verse 32, ever since the world began, no one has been able to open their eyes or of, of someone born blind. If this man was, were not from God, he couldn't have done it. You were born a total sinner, they answered. Are you trying to teach us? And they threw him out of the synagogue. When Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man and asked, Do you believe in the Son of Man? The man answered, Who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. You have seen him, Jesus said, and he is speaking to you. Yes, Lord, I believe, the man said, and he worshiped Jesus. Then Jesus told him, I entered this world to render judgment, to give sight to the blind and to those who think that they see that are blind. Now, friends, in the cancel culture movement, as I said earlier, people are defined by either their latest mistakes or sins from the past, and even some from decades ago. Their social recovery is basically very rare, but Jesus loved and still loves people who are canceled. Amen? Think about it, friends. We read about them in Scripture, from the tax collector to the zealots to the prostitutes to even his disciples. Jesus was unwilling to cancel anybody, anybody, even though Thomas doubted that Jesus was really alive after Jesus rose from the grave. You can read about it in John 20, 27, and it says this, Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hands into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. He didn't say to, to Doubting Thomas, which we all call him, oh, because you don't believe in me, even though you've been with me and you've walked with me and you've talked with me, but now you're doing this, I cancel you out. No soup for you. No, Jesus didn't do that. Peter denied Jesus three times while being prosecuted or persecuted. Um, and if there was anyone who should have been canceled, it should have been him. But he wasn't. And what about Jesus' half-brother James, who refused to believe it? In all of those cases, more than ever, Jesus didn't cancel anyone out. As a matter of fact, Jesus transformed people's shame-ridden identity into one characterized by honor. Think about it from the blind man to the little wee Zacchaeus to the prostitute woman who broke the alabaster box and, and poured perfume over Jesus' feet and worshipped him and so forth at a dinner party. He replaced a temporary cancellation that was bestowed by the hypocrites, by the religious leaders, and by others in society with a transcendent honor bestowed only by God from the blind man to even the woman who was caught in adultery. Now, while the cancel culture would respond with shame and, and indignation, Jesus responds with love. He responds with forgiveness and grace. And many in today's world are, are searching for a recovered or even redeemed identity in which we're living in today. But the cancel culture will not give it to them. But I'll tell you who can give it to you. His name is Jesus. And as the church of Jesus Christ, we're supposed to do the same. So how should we respond as Christians to this movement called the cancel culture? Well, I want to encourage you to write this down. And number one is this. Use wisdom in what you say. Use wisdom in what you post or what you do. Now, let me tell you why, friends. Because we live in a world where, where, where more than ever our words are being published, our words are being recorded, things that we say are being caught on camera and so forth. And we must simply be wise about how we conduct ourselves as followers of Jesus Christ, especially in the days that we're living in. We need to avoid saying things that have no eternal significance. Have you noticed that we say things that have no eternal significance, but we think that it's so authoritative and so like needed in our culture today, and it has no eternal significance in that moment. A byproduct of our connection to God should always help us to avoid saying stupid or hurtful or selfish things about other people or about whatever it is that we're dealing with in our world today. Matthew 12, 36 says, Jesus said that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. Yikes. Think about Proverbs 18, 21. It says, words have the power of life and death. Another way as Christians we should respond to such a movement like the cancel culture is beware of animosity. Beware of malice developing in your heart or bitterness towards other people. For example, when you think of the word malice, it describes how we behave when we take pleasure in someone else's misfortune. We get excited about it. We're like, yes. 
Now, should people be held accountable for their actions, especially if they're wrong or they're, or they're evil? Absolutely. But it's another thing to tear someone down, especially if you don't know them, or hold a grudge against someone you do know, or wanting to do uh, something to them, or, or even hating them, not because of the, they're a danger to society, but simply because we want to see them fail. We want to see them lose their job. We want, we, we want to see them go through pain like we've gone through in our lives. And as a church, we've got to pause. We've got to search our hearts. We've got to beware of animosity or malice or bitterness because all of us, sometime or another, are going to deal with these temptations towards other people, sometime or another. And none of us is above celebrating the downfall of someone we don't like. We have to acknowledge our sinful nature. We have to confess it before the living God. We've got to repent of it, and we've got to fight against this thing, friends. It's thick in our world today. Matthew 5, says, But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. I think we would all do good to take heart, to take the words of Jesus, what he just said there, and that is to pray for our enemies. Is it hard to have animosity or bitterness or malice towards someone, especially if you're praying for them. I guarantee you, if you begin to pray for someone or a group of people or whoever it may be, your, your demeanor is going to change in that process. As you ask God to give you the ability to love them, as you ask God to give you the ability to forgive them. And another way as Christians we should respond to such a movement like the cancel culture is we've got to choose redemption over revenge. We've got to choose redemption over revenge. Even if someone says or does something obviously wrong, yes, God will deal with them. God is a God of judgment and so forth. But we have to maintain a posture of restoration in the middle of the discipline or the things that are happening. We have to believe the best that, that the hearts and minds of those individuals can change in the circumstances that they're dealing with. It's time that we give people the benefit of the doubt. We don't live in a culture like that anymore. The benefit of the doubt has been thrown out the window from politicians to those running for office, uh, to those that are perhaps uh, nominees for the Supreme Court and so forth. If someone fails or someone uh, admittedly dismisses them as wrong forever or irredeemable, that produces, you know what that produces, friends? That produces a hopeless world. And none of us want to live in that kind of world where basically there's, there's no grace, there's, there's no, uh, no one's redeemable. It's just basically there's no hope for anyone. Who wants to live in a world like that? That's not the kind of world that God came to establish on this earth. But if we don't make any room for repentance, if we don't make any room for forgiveness or a fresh start for anyone, we're bound to find everyone canceled for one reason or another, just like some in our culture are doing because none of us are without blemish. None of us. Jesus even said that to the religious leaders who brought the woman who literally was caught in adultery, what should they do with her? And what did Jesus say? Cancel her. No. In John 8, 7, it says they, the religious leaders, kept demanding an answer. So Jesus stood up and said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. And guess what? Everyone started dropping their stones like flies. Even the Bible says in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now I've heard people refer to pastors or other people in the church uh, uh, whether it's this person or that person or this group or that group, as the holiest people in the church. Let me just say this. Lord, have mercy on people who think that. Because no one is holy but God. Everyone has flaws. Everyone has mistakes. Everyone has issues. No one is sinless. There is no one in the church, whether it's an individual or a group of people, that are the holiest because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And what is heartbreaking more than anything about the cancel culture movement is when people experience blowback or hardship from words or actions they did several years ago or decades ago. Let's just be honest with each other this morning, friends. When we were young, when we were a child or we were a teenager or we were a young adult, did you ever say or do something that was stupid that you regret? I mean, thank God we didn't have social media like we have today. I mean, we did have MySpace. I don't even know if that's still around, or maybe it's a waste of space, I'm not sure. But the bottom line is, we all did things. We've all made mistakes. And actually, at the heart of cancel culture, I believe is it, there's a self-righteous attitude. If your day is spent exclusively shaming those who do wrong, your goal is not restoration. Your goal, let me tell you what your goal is. Your goal is to cause discord and division. You might think you're doing the right thing, but you're doing something that is displeasing in the eyes of God. Guilt and shame are ineffective as motivating change in someone's life, but that is what most people do. But the Bible says that there is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. 
But unfortunately, as the church of Jesus Christ, we're the only ones that destroy our own by what we say or what we do. The Apostle Paul said it this way in Romans 12, 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with canceling them out. No, with good. With good. When society or even people in the church practice cancel culture about someone's past words or actions, they are often demonstrating that a person's words or actions at any given time revealed show the true unchangeable nature of that person. And that simply is not true to some degree. Every single one of us would disavow certain things that we've said in the past or done in the present. Either people's minds can change, people can mature, or people simply use different words today or, or not say anything at all. And while we're all accountable for our words and our actions today, past or even present people should be given a chance. They should be given a chance. Isn't that grace? Where what they've done or said is not necessarily the final word of their character. Because we choose to believe in the redemption power of Jesus Christ when he died on that cross. And as Christians, we should believe this at the core of our being. Why? Because what is the gospel of Jesus Christ all about? The gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of the gospel, is about redemption. It's about redemption. It's about transformation. I mean, think about it, friends. Was, was Peter de, Peter's denial of Jesus the final word of his life? Absolutely not. No, he ended up being the rock on which Jesus Christ was built. Was Paul's violent uh, attacks on Christians the final word on him? Certainly not. He ended up writing almost half of the books of the New Testament. Are David's adultery and murder the whole story of his life? No, not at all, because he repented and he remembered, though he was flawed, he was a wonderful king of Israel who was a man after God's own heart. You see, it's a wonderful thing when a person says, yes, I said that. I was wrong. Will you forgive me? I wish I hadn't said that. I wish I would have not done that stupid or ugly thing. I hope I never say or do that again. I'm truly sorry. I apologize. I've grown a lot since that time when I said this or that or did that. And a person who says that is not demonstrating that they're not taking responsibility, but rather a person who says this is demonstrating that people change. People grow. People experience redemption, and, and to dig up offenses in the far past is to demonstrate that we don't believe that people can change. When we dig up things or we focus and say, that's you, that's you, that's you, that's you, then we're saying that, you know what, there's no change. There's no hope. And that is the sad mark of a canceled culture. But as believers as Jesus, we're called to, to wisely navigate the culture in which God has placed us in. He's placed us in this culture that we live in today. And one way that we can be countercultural is to take great care with what we say, to search our hearts in the rhythm of animosity, bitterness, and malice, and to view others through the eyes of redemption. Thank God that he didn't view us as a lost cause. Think about our friends. As men and women, to, to be redeemed and forgiven is one of the most greatest gifts that we could ever give, be given in this thing called life. And may we as his church go and express that same love and compassion towards other people. Now, as we close today's message, rem remember when Jesus was arrested? Maybe you saw the Passion of the Christ, or you recall it. Basically, what happened was his disciple, Simon Peter, took the sword from one of the soldiers, and what did he do? He cut an apple. No, he cut one of the guy's ears off in the process, who was trying to arrest Jesus. And what did Jesus do to Peter? Way to go! Thank you! No, he rebuked Peter for what he had done. Even though Peter knew Jesus was facing injustice, you might be right in your principle for what you feel like you need to do. But you may be wrong in your attitude and your spirit because to be kind is to be holy. I also know that it's God's kindness that leads to what? It leads us to repentance. He forgives all of us and he restores each of us, especially every time we fail. And, and we all need to afford everyone else the same grace. We need to afford everyone else the same uh, love and forgiveness, especially in the days that we are living in. So every head is bowed and eyes are closed in this holy moment, and maybe you need God's forgiveness for things that you've said or done, or maybe that you've hurt someone in the past or in the present, or maybe you just need more of God's wisdom to guard your heart on what you say or do, whether it's in the present or something that may come about in the future. And that's where you're at. Just say, Lord, give me that ability to not only forgive me for the things that I've said or done, but give me wisdom 
Secondly, perhaps you're dealing with animosity or bitterness or malice towards someone and you need God to give you a spirit of self-control or maybe a spirit of patience or perseverance when it comes to those individuals. Maybe you desire to, to, for God to give you more of His love so that you won't keep a record of wrong regarding what someone has done to you. Maybe that's where you're at. And you just need the Spirit of the living God to fall afresh on you. And, and if that's you, just tell the Lord, Lord, here's the animosity I have towards this person or that group or, or, or bitterness or malice or whatever it may be. And Lord, help me to apply your love in those circumstances to keep no record of wrong uh, and, not, and, and, to, and to not cancel them out in that situation. And maybe you need to forgive yourself or someone else in the process and you want to receive his redemption. You want to receive his grace and his forgiveness because that is what the gospel is all about. It's all about redemption. You can choose revenge or you can choose redemption on how you're going to counter culture, this uh, cancel culture movement in what you say or what you do. And maybe you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior or rededicate your life back to Christ today. You can, you can because today is the day of salvation. No matter what time or hour or day you're watching this, this um, service today. And the Bible says that those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So let me pray for you today. Let me believe that God's going to minister to you and touch you before I give it back over to Monty, who just has some things to share. And then I have a giving living moment to give you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray right now for the individual that's watching or hearing that Lord needs your forgiveness for things that they've said or done. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord God, that when the enemy reminds them of their past, that you would remind them of their future that they may have lost some battles, but they're going to win the war because greater is he that is in them than he who is in the world. Lord, give them wisdom. Give us wisdom to guard our hearts on what we say or do, not only now, but in the future, Lord. We're not perfect. We're flawed. We make mistakes, Lord. But by your grace, we're able to stand and we receive your grace in the name of Jesus. Father, right now, I pray for those that need for, to, to forgive themselves or someone else in the process. Lord, that during this process, they'll receive redemption, grace, and forgiveness because that is what the gospel is all about. And maybe that's you just, just maybe you need to forgive yourself for things that you've done. Or maybe you need to forgive someone else in this process. Or maybe you want to receive Jesus or rededicate your life to him right now. And where you're at, just say, Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. I've fallen short of your glory. Just repeat that with me right now. I believe, Jesus, you died on that cross and you rose from the grave. And I confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Have your way in me. In the name of Jesus, I receive the free gift of salvation and the forgiveness of my sins in your precious name. Amen. Lord, I rejoice with someone that maybe prayed that prayer of, of, of um, first-time salvation or rededicating their life to you. So, Father, we thank you that, Lord, we can counterculture this cancel culture movement through the redemptive power of the Almighty God and the gospel that comes with it through the, through the blood of Jesus Christ and through his word. So, God, give us boldness. Give us the ability, Lord God, to see people the way you see them and not the way we see them or the world sees them. In the name of Jesus, help us to be unshakable, to stand firm in your word in an unsteady world. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great day. Hey, y'all. If you enjoyed today's service, please share it with your friends and family. If you haven't already, we would love it if you would give us a like on Facebook by searching City View San Diego. If your friends and family like the service, please encourage them to give us a like as well. You can also follow our podcast on Spotify or Apple Podcasts by searching City View San Diego or by visiting our website and going to the messages page. We also recently started a new YouTube page and would love some new subscribers. You can find us at youtube.com slash C slash City View Church SD. We want to invite each of you to join us for our next drive-in outdoor service here on the church campus at 6 p.m. this Saturday night. Or you can join us on our Facebook page, website, or YouTube channel from 6 p.m. Saturday night and any time after that. Coming up next week, Pastor Troy will continue his series called Unshakable, Standing Firm in an Unsteady World by ministering to us about current movements happening in America and what the Bible teaches us about them. You can email us at prayer at cityvusd.com to let us know how we can pray for you, how this message ministered to you, or perhaps today you gave your life to Christ for the first time or rededicated your life to Him. If you did, we have a gift for you called One Little Yes Can Change Your Life. Just email us at prayer at cityvusd.com or call the church at 858-560-1870 to let us know you made the greatest decision of your life today. 
One last thing, just a quick reminder, there are three ways you can continue to help support God's church and the kingdom. The first is by giving online through our website at cityviewsd.com and clicking on Give Now. From there, you can give your regular tithe and offerings, missions offerings, or anything else you want to give. All the info is right there on the giving page. Second, you can text to give at 858-780-5141. Or lastly, you can do it the good old-fashioned way and mail it into the church office at 8404 Phyllis Place, San Diego, California, 92123. Please make sure to put attention to the finance department. Make sure to check out our website for the latest City View news. And here is Pastor Troy to close us out with a quick giving living moment. As we continue to worship the Lord through the giving of our tithe and offerings, I'd like to share Mark 9, 41 with you. It says, for, whatever gives you, for whoever gives you a cup of cold water to drink in my name, because of you belong to Christ, so surely I say to you, they will by no means lose their reward. Now God loves to reward those who give from a cup of cold water in his name to also those who faithfully give financially through their tithe and offerings. Jesus desires to bless those who live a life of generosity, not only with their time or abilities, but also in what the Lord has blessed them in financially. So let me pray for you as we close out our service online today, that God will be with you as you give either today or sometime this week. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to just say thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy that follows us all the days of our life. And Lord, as we give, Lord Jesus, of our tithe or our missions offering, or beyond that, Lord God, I pray that you would use this offering, Lord God, to expand your kingdom, that souls would be saved, delivered, and healed, and in return, you would reward those that give, Lord God, of their finances, sacrificially or above and beyond what you've blessed them with. In the name above all names, the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hey, have a great week. We'll see you next week. God bless.